looking at the seven churches of Asia Minor, so let's open in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time to gather to open your word, and we pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit that our hearts will be renovated on your truth. And Lord, may we never forget the truth. May the Holy Spirit bring to mind the things we need at any given moment. So help us to to grow today even further in the Word, even being reminded of things we've already heard, but how important it is to be reminded of your Word. Lord, we want to pray for um, Linda as we have the uh, memorial or funeral service this coming week. We just pray for her continued strength and and, and may uh, Glenn's passing to you even be again uh, glorified as we glorify in the Son of God who now holds them in His hands face to face. And Lord, we pray for Annette and her, her um, occupation of nursing as she is helping so many people uh, with the COVID and other things. And we just pray that she has uh, protection physically and give her spiritual strength and physical strength Um, as that occupation takes so much out of you, no matter uh, what we're going through in our culture, it's just a a very difficult job. And and may she shine the light of Christ, too, during uh, this time when people are so uncertain of the future. And Lord, guide us in your word, and as we've already said, may, may we grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, and how to live for him in the meantime until he returns. In Jesus we pray, amen. Well, we're in the letter to the church at Smyrna. We're in the second church of the seven. So let's go ahead and read the entire section and then pick up where we left off last week. It says in verse 8, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The first and the last who was dead and who has come to life, says this. So remember, every church gets a description right at the beginning of who Jesus is. So verse 8 gives a description of Jesus, the first and the last. He was dead. In other words, he died on the cross, and then he rose from the dead. He has come to life. So he says this. So remember, Jesus is speaking. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you're rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they're Jews and are not, But instead, they are a synagogue or a gathering of Satan. Don't fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. But be faithful until death and I'll give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. So last time we left off in verse 10. With that final phrase, be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. I think this speaks of rewards. Crowns speak of rewards for a believer's faithfulness in the spiritual life. So based on that, I want to review the biblical teaching of the judgment seat of Christ. I know I've already talked to you about the overcomer. Some hold that as a positional idea. Some hold it as a walk issue that receives rewards, no matter where you line up there, if you don't believe that that's a a walk issue, you have many other passages in the Bible that clearly teach a theology of rewards that don't have anything to do with the overcomer in, in a particular verse. So there's other passages that teach rewards for faithfulness, which will occur at the judgment seat of Christ. So today we're going to review, um, that particular teaching, the judgment seat of Christ. First of all, why even study the judgment seat of Christ? I'll give you four reasons. Number one, it gives us a sense of accountability to God. Number two, it clarifies God's purpose and plan for our lives and gives us a greater perspective of a personal God who is sovereign and active in the affairs of human history. So God didn't wind up the clock and walk away. He's in, he interacts all through history in any given time, and He is with us and is noticing um, what we're going through. He's, even as our text says, I know your tribulation. He, he knows what we're going through. Number three, it helps us realize the importance of obedience to God in our lives. Um, just because we're saved, that doesn't mean God doesn't want us to obey Him. 
And then number four, it gives us fair warning of this future evaluation that all Christians will face. And how many Christians will be at this judgment seat and won't even know about it? They'll be like, where are we? What is this? Uh, Well, you weren't expecting it? Well, either way, he won't say, well, you are ignorant. You can go around the throne. You don't have to stand here. We're all going to face it no matter what. So we have fair warning uh, through the teaching. Well, let's call, uh, well, let's look at what uh, they call this judgment seat from the Greek language. We often call it the judgment seat of Christ, or have you ever heard it called the bema? Some pronounce it bema. They lengthen the, the, the vowel a little longer. The words judgment seat, those two words translate this Greek word bema. And by the way, that's actually... Um, Uh, one of those Bema platforms in Corinth. I remember talking to Pastor Robbie Dean one time when they went over to that area of the world and he was guiding a a tour over there and uh, he said they stopped and taught 1 Corinthians 3 at the Bema seat at one of the... I thought, how awesome to do that, to be at a location where rulers actually stood on those platforms and, and, and handled cases. And then we'll stand before the... Uh, Bema, the the Bema to Christu, the judgment seat of Christ. And um, I don't have that kind of prop here. I have to give you a picture of it. (laughs) But uh, there is a picture of one of those in ruins now um, from the ancient world. I want to read you what one Greek lexicon said of the Bema. So Bema is a Greek noun from bino, which means to, to go up. In other words, a step or a pace or a footstep. By implication, It refers to any elevated place to which the ascent is by steps. For example, a stage or a pulpit for a speaker or a reader. And what's interesting, in Nehemiah 8.4, remember he stood up and spoke from a wooden podium? That's Hebrew Bible, but the Septuagint translates it with bima. So it has the idea of a raised platform where one spoke. So it's an elevated seat like a throne in a theater at Caesarea on which Herod sat. More commonly, it means a tribunal especially of a judge or a magistrate. Uh, Many scriptures there, and I'll go over a few of them here in a moment. In the New Testament, the word is translated judgment seat. The the judge invariably sat on a special seat or throne. Jerusalem and the smaller cities alike had their thrones for judgment. Um, In Rome, magistrate and jury were seated together on raised tribunal or bench. The custom extended also to the provinces. In the New Testament, tribunals refer to law courts generally, uh, while Bema is applied to the judgment seat not only of uh, emperors but also of governors. For example, Pilate, Gallio, or Galio, Festus, and so forth sat on these. Bema is even used metaphorically, which will be our subject today, in reference to Christ, Romans 14.10, 2 Corinthians 5.10, in which case the word has an eschatological meaning. In other words, it looks to the future, because all believers will stand the judgment seat of Christ for an evaluation. So just to remind you or reflect on this comment, there are places where Bema shows up where human rulers in the ancient world uh, stood or sat to, to adjudicate cases. So one of them is uh, Matthew twenty seven nineteen with Pilate. Remember the Roman governor Pilate who tried Jesus Christ? It says, while he was sitting on the judgment seat which is the Bema, Uh, his wife sent him a message saying, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. Uh, John 19, 13 uses it again for Pilate on the judgment seat. Many other rulers in Rome sat on these Bema seats. Herod in Acts 12, 21, it was translated in English Bibles as a rostrum. Uh, Galileo in Acts 18, 12 through 17. Festus in Acts 25, verse 6, 10 and 17 uh, a lot of Bibles translate it uh, Caesar's tribunal, but it's the same, the same Greek word. So these judgment seats were common in the ancient world, and the Scripture is clear that every one of us will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We'll look at this text again, but 2 Corinthians 5.10, here it is. For we, believers, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Um, So 
There's the scripture validation. It's very clear. Uh, I would think that's absolutely clear that we'll be there. Don't you agree? Uh, so we will stand this judgment. And who will be the one on the seat? It says the judgment seat of Christ, but make no mistake, the Bible says Jesus is the judge of all mankind. Uh, John 5, 26 and 27, uh, for the Father has life in himself, just as he has life in himself, Jesus said, even so he gave to the Son to have life in himself, and he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. So the Father has empowered all authority to Jesus to be the judge. Peter even said in Acts 10, 42, and he, referring to God, ordered us to preach to the people and to solemnly testify that this is the one who he has appointed, been appointed by God as judge and the, of all the living and the dead. So Jesus was appointed by the Father to judge all mankind. So again, we have two central verses for the judgment seat of Christ. We just looked at this one. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10, the other one's in Romans 14, verse 10, but let's go to the 2 Corinthians text first. So please turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 5.10. Let's look at this a little more carefully. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. <clears throat> Before we read the 10th verse, let's back up a little to verse 6 and get a context. Paul is writing the second letter to the Corinthian believers. And he says in verse 6, Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. So what he's saying is, when we're in this present body, this fallen body, on this earth, we're absent from the Lord, we're not in heaven. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and home with the Lord. Which this, to me, disproves soul sleep. You know, people say you just sleep in the grave and there's uh, no interaction or anything till the resurrection well, wait a minute, when we die, we're absent from the body and with the Lord. And how do you explain the martyrs in heaven in Revelation 6 that are saying, Lord, when are you going to avenge our blood? And they haven't been resurrected yet. So is there soul sleep? I don't think so. Now, Daniel 12, 2 says many will sleep in the dust. That, doesn't, that just means they're going to physically die and one day all will be raised and judged uh, either to damnation or eternal life. So... Paul, and I hope we can all agree, we would rather be absent from the body and home with the Lord. And didn't he say in Philippians, that would be far better. Are, are, are you all agreeing with me or not? Are you absolutely sure? <laughs> Wouldn't you rather be there than on this devil's world, in this devil's world? I think so. It'd be far better. But as Paul said in Philippians 1, I have service to do for the Lord, so it's His timing on that. So verse 9, Therefore, we have as our ambition, you could translate that as aspiration, whether at home or absent, in other words, from verse 6, whether we're home in this present earthly body and absent from the Lord. So we have as our ambition, whether home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. So we're absent from the Lord right now in, the, in terms of being here in this life, but our aspiration or ambition should be to please Him in the meantime. Then verse 10, For we must all appear before the two bematas to Christu, the judgment seat of Christ. Why? Well, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds or works in the body according to what he has done, and now two categories, whether good or bad. Uh, the word bad, phalos, could be also translated worthless. So God will judge our deeds. And notice, some deeds that we might think are good, He'll say no, wrong, not good. What might be a reason a deed might not be good? The motivation of the heart. 
And God knows that perfectly, where man doesn't always know that. But he'll know all that perfectly. As a matter of fact, the motives of the heart known by God is 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Therefore, don't go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. No man can do this perfectly. Only God can. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. So when we stand the judgment, our works will be evaluated and God will know 100% why we did even what we did. So believers in Jesus Christ will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The, on a, hear carefully. This is not a judgment to determine whether or not a Christian makes it into heaven. He's already there. He's already saved. He's resurrected. Jesus has already died for his sins. He paid for the sins of the world at the cross. It is finished, he said in John 19.30 after the crucifixion. And if you believe in him, the one who died for our sins in 1 Peter 2.24, he bore our sins in his own body on the cross, you're now saved permanently from the penalty of sin. So this is not an evaluation or a judgment to determine if you get in or not, but an evaluation of our works as children of God to determine rewards for faithfulness in the spiritual life. However, unbelievers, those who reject Christ as Savior in this life, will stand a different judgment called the great white throne judgment, a totally different place, and they'll be judged eternally in the lake of fire, Revelation 20, 11 through 15. I don't think we stand that judgment. I don't think these are the same judgments. I think they're different. So that's the first central passage. The second one is in Romans 14.10. You don't have to turn there. I have it up here on the slide. But Paul tells the church at Rome in Romans 14.10, But you, why do you judge your brother? Is it wrong to judge your brother? Uh, he's setting this up again. <laughs> Yeah, everyone goes to Matthew 7, don't judge. Really? Then why does Jesus say, remove the log out of your own eye, then you'll see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. Oh, so I can judge eventually. But what is, so what is he teaching? Don't judge self-righteously. And who was doing that in his day in Matthew 7? The Pharisees. We take that out of context and you can't judge. Yeah. Imagine being a kid saying, Mom, you can't judge me. You told me I didn't do right today. You're judging me. I think we get the point. So contextually, you have to be very careful. What's happening in Cor or with the Romans is he's saying don't judge your brother with that self-righteous judgment or improper judgment that's incorrect. So he says, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? See, that the next line says contempt. And then he says, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. When's the last time you thought about that? Do we, I think sometimes, you know, the unbeliever suppresses God in unrighteousness. I think some Christians do too. We don't want to think about this stuff. When I talked about martyrdom last week, is that comfortable? It's not really comfortable for us where people may have to be called to give their life for Jesus, the ultimate price. And how many will say, I don't know the man, like Peter did at one time? A lot of Christians will probably do that when given the opportunity, and I don't know, I might be the same guy. You know, we can stand up here boldly and talk when all I have is Christians in the audience. <laughs> what will I say when there's no one around but me and everyone who hates the Lord? Um, I know what I should do. So don't, don't look to me on what you should do. Look to the Bible on what you should do, what Jesus calls you to do. Um, if I failed at it and you saw that, should you fail at it now? No, you should do the right thing and not fail at it. So we're all going to stand this judgment seat of God. And what's interesting, what is, what is it called here that's different? Yeah, the judgment seat of Christ 
Y'all must be terrible at those puzzles where you have two pictures of a, a two rooms and what's the difference between the two? I never get those. I pick out one and there's like 20 of them and I'm like, oh, I'm just not looking. The judgment seat of God. So what I'm thinking, if it's the judgment seat of Christ and Corinthians and the judgment seat of God and it's the same place, Jesus is who? He is God. I would also use this in my points, many points, that Jesus is deity. Not my first line of attack. I just, John 1.1 1, is good enough for me. John 8.58. I got a list of them, but I'd put this one in there because Jesus is God and he'll be the one who judges. Unless Paul meant it's the Father's judgment seat that he lets Jesus sit on, but I don't I think that's correct. I think Christ is God and this actually buttress, buttresses that point. So we have the judgment seat of Christ. We'll all stand there and notice we got to be very careful how we judge our brothers with contempt because we're all going to be judged by the Lord. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 3. Let's look at a passage that deals with rewards for the believer. It doesn't mention the judgment seat of Christ in this chapter, 1 Corinthians 3, but I think the rewards will be given at the judgment seat. I think that's safe to say based on what we read here and then what, we'll, what we've already seen in 2 Corinthians 5.10. I think that's safe to say that. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 3 verse 10 and read through verse 15. Verse 10 says, According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man builds on the foundation, and notice, Six things, but two distinct categories. If he builds on the foundation with, here's the first category, the first uh, triplet, gold, silver, and precious stones, and then you have the other three, wood, hay, or straw. Uh, the King James says stubble. So we have things of value that survive fire, and then things of Value, no value that will be burned up. Each man's work will become manifest. For the day, now some future day obviously, that's I think the day of the judgment seat of Christ, it will show it because it will be revealed with fire. Now this isn't the lake of fire. He's going to use fire in this metaphor here as a description of testing something to affirm its value. And the fire, notice, will test the quality of each man's work. The Greek says what sort it is. So a lot of Bibles say, well, that means obviously the quality of that work. That's right down to the very motive. If any man's work, verse 14, if any man's work, so this is the born-again believer, if his work which he has built on it remains... Remains on what? Well, the foundation of gold, silver, and precious stones. He will be allowed into heaven. Does the text say that? No, he will receive a reward. Now, the Greek word is misthos, which is a word for a recompense or a reward for something well done. So if you have works that were obviously on on the side of gold, silver, and precious stones, you get a reward. So that's obviously, remember, he'll judge us according to our deeds, whether good or worthless. What, which deed is that? The good deed is the one, gold, silver, precious stones, something of value. And some have even said the word agathos for good in 2 Corinthians 5.10 has an idea of good, of, an, of intrinsic value. However, keep reading, if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. He will zamio thesatai, which means to, to lose something. It's in a passive, he will suffer loss, a future passive verb. So in the future, you're going to suffer loss. Now the question is, loss of what? 
Isn't contextually the loss a reward from verse 14? It's not loss of salvation. I can prove that even better because keep reading. You look back to the reward of verse 14, that's what you'll lose. But then it says, but he himself will be... I'm going through this carefully because people who think you can lose their salvation... Well, here's Paul constantly telling how carnal these Corinthians are, but keeps affirming they're, they're going to heaven, they're going to be resurrected over and over. He condemns their behavior, but not, doesn't ever say they don't have the position or they'll lose it. So if your work is burned up, you'll suffer loss of reward. However, he himself will, will be saved. So you don't lose your salvation, you lose reward. That's what you risk yet as through fire. So you'll be saved as through fire. It's an idiom of the day that probably means something like what we would say, but you'll get in by the skin of your teeth, wherever that came from. But you know what I mean? You're going to go in, but you're not going to have a life of valuable service to the Lord to show for it, which is no small thing. So there's two central verses on the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.10, Romans 14.10, a passage that deals with rewards that we'll all have to uh, deal with one day, and the Lord is going to be the one who tests the quality of our work, and He'll know exactly. Uh, you can't argue. If He burns that up, you can't go, wait a minute, I think you're wrong about that. Let's talk about that work you burned up. No, we won't be arguing about it. He'll know. Don't you wish... I mean, one of the reasons why we can't get justice in the world is because of corruption. But another reason is, even when a, a judge who is well-meaning is trying his best, what doesn't he always have? He doesn't always have the facts and the motive. He doesn't know. And he's trying to determine who's lying. You ever watch Judge Judy? That's all she's trying to figure out is who's lying. And sometimes she picks that up in like 30 seconds. You're lying, sir. And they're great at catching you in that. But other, some judges are really trying hard, but it's very difficult to evaluate things when you don't have all the facts, and we have a God that does. So we know true justice will abound when Jesus rules because he's God in the flesh, and he's all-knowing, omniscient. Well, now let's look at rewards in terms of crowns because Revelation 2.10, it says, Be faithful until death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Um, so let's talk about the word crown. It's the Greek word stephanos, again, where we get the name Stephen. Sometimes we spell Stephen with a V, but there is a S-T-E-P-H-E-N. And this is the name Stephen who died for his faith in Acts 7. His name is stephanos. Um, so the word is translated crown. Now, when I think of a crown, I think of a gold crown of a king. Now, here's what one writer said. In classical Greek, not used of the kingly crown, but the crown for victory in the games. Of civil worth, military valor, nuptial joy, so wedding celebrations, festival gladness. It was woven of oak, ivy, and myrtle, or any of these materials, olive leaves or flowers, used as a wreath or a garland. So when we think of crown, in our minds, we, I think we think of the gold, jeweled crown. But in the ancient world, it would be a, a crown made of ivy or oak or myrtle leaves or something like that. Dr. Joseph Dillo, in his book, The Reign of the Servant Kings, he said, this was the crown of exaltation given for victory in the games, achievement in war, so warriors in battle could be given a reward for v a valor on the battlefield, and in places of honor at feasts. In the New Testament, it is plain that the Stephanos, whereof St. Paul speaks, is always the conquerors and not the kings. This crown is not like the royal crown. It's a crown that is given on the basis of merit. Um, so are there any more crowns ever mentioned other than Revelation 2.10? Or is that the only one? I only have, need one verse for something to be true, but there are a bunch of them. So let me show you these. You have the crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4.8. The crown of glory, 1 Peter 5, 2-4. 1 
the crown of incorruption, sometimes called the victor's crown, 1 Corinthians 9.25, the crown of life, our passage, Revelation 2.10, also mentioned in James 1.12 in a, in a uh, text dealing with persevering in trials, just like Revelation 2 is. And then you have one that's contested by some, the crown of rejoicing, 1 Thessalonians 2.19 and Philippians 4.1. Now, I'm going to go through every one of these. If you're writing them down, they'll, they'll come up again in subsequent slides. So let's start with the first one, the crown of righteousness. <clears throat> the crown of righteousness. Some are calling this the crown for those who are believers who have longed for the appearing of Jesus Christ, which means they've been actively waiting for Him. Where I think some Christians, they got saved and over time they have just forgotten God. They give Him Christmas or Easter or something like that, but the rest of the year they're not really thinking much about Him and how they should be living in anticipation of His sure return for us. So some have called it the crown for those who have longed for the appearing of Jesus, um, which is in 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. So let's go to 2 Timothy 4. Let's look at this text, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> By the way, this passage reveals Jesus as the judge, like I've already mentioned, and the actual one who will reward believers with crowns for faithfulness. It's both. He's the judge and he's the rewarder. So verse 1 Paul, writing to Timothy, says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, speaking of Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. So there's his appearing. It's always, or he's even now speaking of his coming back, his appearing, and then the kingdom he'll rule. Now, this really applies to me because Paul wrote what I'm getting ready to read you in verse 2, because Paul wrote this to Pastor Timothy. However, by application, I would say parents ought to be uh, teaching the word of their children and so forth, but here's what he told the pastor to do. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, Exhort, the word exhort means to encourage, <clears throat> with great patience and instruction. So preach the word and then got to do it patiently and with instruction because you got to go to the word for that. Now I think we all go, oh, this sounds like our culture, and it has for a long time, but it says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. So there, there's a time where people will actually accumulate for themselves what they want to hear. My job is not to tell you what you want to hear. My job is to go through the scriptures before God. That is my job. I already have my marching orders. That's simple. Preach the word. Is there any verse that I'm commanded not to preach? Can you find one? Yeah, oh, avoid Leviticus. That's not for the church. But you read Paul, and he's quoting to Gentiles like the Corinthians, Torah. Read Galatians 3, a, a Gentile church. Most of the chapter is a, quotation, a series of quotations and difficult ones from the Old Testament. So this thing, well, no, Peter was the apostle to the Jews, so he taught the Jews the Old Testament and all that. Well, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, and what did he use too? The Old Testament. Didn't he say all scriptures God breathed? Who wrote that? That's in 2 Timothy. Timothy wrote that, right? No, Paul wrote that to Timothy. So all scripture is valuable. Even though we're not under the law of Moses, we can still learn from it. So we have this going on in our day where people don't want sound doctrine. They want to have their ears tickled. And therefore, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth, that's God's word, and will turn aside to myths. But you, Paul tells Timothy, be sober in all things 
endure hardship, and we should do the same, everybody. Do the work of an evangelist, so share the gospel. Fulfill your ministry. And then Paul says, knowing that his life was very soon coming to an end, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure has come. So Paul knows imminent death is right around the corner. Therefore, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, and I have kept the faith, which is the word. And in the future, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness. So there's our word Stephanos for a crown. Now he connects it to righteousness. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, Jesus, will award me on that day. Back to 1 Corinthians 3, you'll get rewards if you're faithful. Paul had built his life on gold, precious, the precious stones. But get this, not only to me, but to all those who have lo loved his appearing. Now, some try to make this a positional truth. Well, all believers technically are loving his appearing. I don't believe that. I think he's talking about the believer who, after salvation, is constantly thinking about the Lord's return and living accordingly. Okay? And if you do you'll be rewarded with this particular crown. And then you have the second one, the crown of glory. This is probably more specific to church leaders who lead properly based on 1 Peter uh, 5.1. I think this is the only place the crown of glory shows up in the Bible with the word Stephanos with the, and also the word doxa for glory. So 1 Peter 5, I got it all here, so we'll read from the slide above, 1 Peter 5.1. Therefore, I exhort the old elders among you. And then Peter says, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that's to be revealed, he tells the leaders, shepherd the flock of God. Okay, that's the word poimino in the imperative. That's a word to shepherd sheep. But aren't pastors sh under shepherds under the chief shepherd? So he uses the shepherd sheep metaphor, which is all over the Old Testament. So like sheep, you're members of a, a local body, the pastor's the shepherd, and he's commanded to actively shepherd the flock of God by exercising oversight. That word exercising oversight is the word for a bishop. I think it's all the same. They're, these are interchangeable terms. The bishop is not separate from the pastor. So I'm the bishop in a certain way or exercise oversight in a certain way. And here it is, not under compulsion, but voluntarily. Would you like it if I was forced to come to talk to you? If you God, I hate those people at that church, but I'll go. Oh, I can't wait to go hear David. <laughs> you wouldn't like that. You, you don't want to be forced to do this. And if it ever, for a pastor, if, if uh, pastoring ever becomes compulsion and you're it's not voluntary, as he says in the next one. It's time to step down. You don't want to do this anymore? Um, it should be something you love to do. Not, uh, not under compulsion, but voluntary. According to the will of God. So now we've got to get to the Word again. Not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge. So you have authority, but you can't lord it over them, but proving to be examples to the flock. And here it is. And when the chief shepherd appears, and most Bibles will have capital C and then a capital S. It's a special Greek word here that means a chief shepherd, the, the greatest one of all, the lead one. So that's Jesus, clearly. John 10, I am the good shepherd. So he's the chief shepherd. So when he appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So there it is in the context of leaders in the church. And then we have the crown of life. Again, Stephanos is used with the word zoe, uh, the word for life. Some will say this is the reward given for believers who persevere under trials in the spiritual life. Well, Revelation 2.10, our passage, but let's go to James 1.12 here. After saying, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. 
Well, now he says in 112, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. This is not a salvation verse. For the believer who's permanently saved, he's blessed if he perseveres in his spiritual life under trials and tribulation. For once he has been approved, so who's the approver? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's where your your approval will come from. The one who knows all the motives of men, then his approval will come from God. So if you persevere under trial, you will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Again, those who long for his appearing, those who love him. As Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my mandates, John 14, 21. So I think he's talking about those who are actively waiting for him and obeying him until he returns. And then our our text, Revelation 2, 10, don't fear what you're about to suffer Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you'll be tested. And you'll have tribulation for 10 days, but be faithful until death, and I'll give you the crown of life. The one that's often contested as an actual reward is the crown of rejoicing. It's found in 1 Thessalonians 2.19, which says, Paul says of the Thessalonian church, For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation. In other words, a crown of rejoicing. Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? So who is the crown here? It's, a, it's the people, right? Then Philippians 4.1, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved So some don't see this as a reward like the other crowns, but some do. Dr. Dillow said this crown is apparently not a literal crown, but people. Apparently Christ in some way will give special honor to those who have faithfully labored at bringing people to Christ. If that's the case, then there's a crown of rejoicing for leading others to the Lord in evangelism. If that's not a reward, would you evangelize anyway? Please say yes. No, I want something for that. (laughs) Nothing wrong with getting rewards, but hopefully you're doing it because you care that people go to heaven and not eternal judgment. And then the last one, the crown of incorruption. It's uh, sometimes called the victor's crown. One man said it's this. A crown for gaining mastery over the flesh. Maybe. I think um, walking according to the flesh will cause you to do uh, worthless deeds, so no reward. But either way, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 9.24 through 27. Our verse is verse 25, but let's look at 9.24 through 27. First Corinthians 9.24, Paul tells the Corinthian church, which applies to us, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? Now he's going back to the athletic games of his day, like our Olympics today. He says, but only one receives the prize. That would be a reward, right? And then he says this to, the, to believers, Run in such a way that you may win. Now, I think the word in such a way is important. It's the word hutos. It can mean, you ever heard God so loved the world? The word so is that same word, hutos. Is he saying that God so loved us? Like we say, oh, I, 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 I love chocolate cake, but I so love coconut cake. In other words, there's a degree of love. But the word can equally mean in this manner. I argue that when it says, for God so loved the world, I think what he's saying is, God loved the world in this manner. How? By giving his own son. That's the love he demonstrates. God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So if you don't think God loves the world, then look, he gave his only son so that we could have life. 
Sometimes when people translate that, so love the world, it's not a degree for them. They're saying in this manner. I get that, but I'd probably translate it in this manner for greater, greater clarity. So Paul uses it here, run in such a way that you may win. You know what that tells me about the race? You can't make the rules. They're already set, and you can't violate the rules. And we know that in sports, right? If you're running track, you can't cross the lines when you're not supposed to. And I'm, I'm not sure the rules on that is at one lap and then you can move. But I know one thing you can never do on a track that's circular. You can't cut across to win. That would cut, cut your time in half, right? But that violates the rules. In football, you can't catch a touchdown out of bounds. And they get that camera right there on that line. Ooh, he's on the chalk, you know. Uh, there's so many fouls you can have in basketball. You're out of the game. There are rules to games, and we know that. And Paul says we have to run this spiritual race in such a manner that we will win the race. In other words, if you don't compete according to the rules, you won't get the reward. So what does he say in verse 25? Goes to the athletic games imagery again. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. In other words, one that's going to go away. Um, you know, everything just seems to rust or rot or and perishes with this world. So their reward in the games is something that doesn't last, but we an imperishable. You know, our resurrection body is imperishable. This body is perishable. So the wreath we get or the reward is evidently something eternal. Then he says, therefore, I run in such a way, not as without aim. I box in such a way. So they had boxing events back then. Not as beating the air, and I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Some Bibles say disqualified from the prize, meaning losing reward. So in verse 24, you have the word prize. Don't you know that all who run in a race run? All run, but only one receives the prize. So there's only one guy in the race, the running race, that crosses the ticket first right? That tape, whatever. And, and that, no, they always do their chests. And sometimes I don't know how they tell the difference. Those guys hit that tape almost at the same time. But only one gets the gold medal. And then you get the, the, the silver, the bronze. But he's like, one in those athletic games was going to get the prize. Um, so the word prize there is brobeon. Brobeon, a Greek word. It means a prize or something won in the athletic game. So Paul is definitely familiar with the culture and uses illustrations accordingly. So I think the prize here is the imperishable crown or wreath from verse 25, which is an eternal reward, reward for spiritual faithfulness. So the spiritual life is a race. It's also called a walk. We walk by the Spirit, but here it's called a race. So my charge to you, didn't it say a pastor's to encourage, exhort? My exhortation, y'all want me to rebuke you? No, don't do that part. Now my encouragement to you is the spiritual life is a race, so run well. And run all the way to the finish line. When you imagine running a marathon and you get to mile 26, how much is a 26 point something? And you quit. And you had the energy to finish, and you just said, nah, go, to the, go finish the race. Because didn't Paul say that? I have fought the good fight. He's looking at this as I've done this. I have finished the course, and I have kept the faith. Therefore, the crown of righteousness awaits for me. Now, I'm not quite sure. If you quit running at the very end, would you lose all reward? I'm going to let the Lord determine that. I don't think so, but there is a heavy emphasis on finishing the race to receive the reward. So don't, don't play around with that, but it's something the Lord was very... You led 100 people to Christ in the first half of your spiritual life, and then for 25 years you never did. Will you lose a reward for not? You know, all, all, I don't think so, but if I'm wrong and, and the Lord does that, then... I won't argue with him. So there are warnings about crowns. 
I'll give you two of them. Second John 8, 2 John 8, he says, what, talking to believers, watch yourselves that you don't lose what... Um, that you don't lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Which tells me rewards may have varying degree. So maybe it is this. If you finish the race and complete it properly, you get the full reward, but there's still rewards available. But I speculate. But there, you want to receive a full reward, which tells me you might lose reward, 1 Corinthians 3. And then Revelation 3.11, Jesus says, I'm coming quickly. He, that was 2,000 years ago. So what does quickly mean to the Lord? A day is like a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years is like a day. But I think once we get to the other side, we'll say, that life was quick. It will seem like it did go fast. And we say it even now when people get in their 50s and 60s. Wow, life has just flown by. Uh, he, he's coming for sure. But then he says, therefore, hold fast to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Is he saying you'll lose your salvation? I don't think so. You can lose your reward by getting your eyes off the Lord and what uh, has the most priority in life. So one day we'll all honor Jesus Christ, the one who saved us, the one who rewarded us by casting our crowns at his feet. Revelation 4, 10 and 11, it says the 24 elders fall down before him, the one who sits on the throne, and they worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, and the word crowns there is Stephanos, and they'll say this, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and they were created. So we're going to honor the Lord, the one who saved us and the one who rewarded us, the very God who empowered us for service. Uh, we'll honor him by throwing our crowns at his feet. I don't think this means you lose the crown from then on. I just think this is a, a description of honoring the Lord himself. Some people say, so we give the crown back and it's gone for all eternity? We don't get the reward. It's only for the millennium, or I don't. I think it's eternal. As one guy said, you know, when they throw their hats up at graduation, what do you do with the hat? You go pick it up. <laughs> I mean, you get the hat right, and it's somewhere in your closet now. If you're my age, I don't even know if I had mine anymore. But I don't think we lose the reward after a certain time. So many, have you ever heard this? Well, rewards is a selfish motivation. Therefore, it can't be of God. Now, could rewards be a, a selfish motivation? I think it could be in the hearts of some, but it's obviously something God holds out to us. I think if our primary reason for serving God isn't because God is God and Jesus saved us, then we have a problem. Didn't Job, remember Satan says, take away all you've given him, he'll curse you. Did Job do that? No, blessed be the name of the Lord, the one who gives and the one who takes away. So Job was willing to serve God no matter what because he's God. That's I think, should be our heart. However, there's nothing wrong with having rewards as a motivator because he puts it out there as a motivator. Dr. Um, Thomas Constable said this, It's perfectly proper to serve Christ to gain a crown. We'll one day lay it at the feet of our Savior. It's a symbol of a life of faithful service that we performed out of gratitude for His grace to us. I agree. So now as we start to close, and I need to, Revelation 2.11, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. So again, as with all the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3, there's the typical call for he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. They all have that call. Then it says the overcomer will not be hurt by the second death. Is that a promise? Absolute promise? Yeah, when God says something, it's true. There's no, 
You know, I had a guy that left this church when I first got here. You know what he told me? I don't believe in absolute eternal security. Wait, time out. Either he were secure or we're not. Could you, can you imagine that? I love you, honey. You say to your, your wife or your children, do you absolutely love me? What would you say? Yes. I mean, you would think you'd be insulted by it. So he said, God's promise isn't limited because his sovereignty overrides his promises. What? But the sovereign God made a promise and he can't lie and he can't break one. So are you absolutely secure? It's a waste of time to put the word absolute in front of it. Either, he, you, either you are secure or you're not. But th these are people that teach this stuff. So once you get eternal security down, he goes, well, that's not really absolutely sure. So, you know, and you know what determined it? He told me, the way you live. <laughs> and I finally figured out, well, this is, and instantly I went, that's a lordship teaching. Because if you're, they, the lordship people, they believe in eternal security. I heard John MacArthur this week on a recent sermon teach eternal security better than I've ever taught it. But I know he believes in his writings that if you don't persevere, you never were saved to begin with. And I never hear that on the radio when I hear him. But I'm like, oh, good. Leave that one there. That was great. So the Lordship teaching says, well, it's only absolute if you persevere. Now, I'm here to tell you, if you have believed in Christ, you're absolutely secure. And I can drop the word absolute because God said it, and that just settles it. I don't like the bumper sticker. God said it. I believe it, that settles it. You seen that one? It doesn't matter if I believe it. If God said it, that settles it, right? So what that saying is, that settles it. I believe it, so that makes it true. And then now we live in, I'm preaching, I'm sorry, but we live in a culture that says truth is only true if you believe it to be true. Wow. How could I even teach you the Bible? Well, that's your truth. That's not mine. Wait. Um, this is Mark's fault with that absolute comment. <laughs> but that, that was such a profound question to ask somebody. And if he gets that one wrong, I don't blame you for walking away. Because if you don't believe in absolute truth, then don't handle the Bible in front of me. Because it's all just whatever you want it to mean. And we have raised a postmodern culture today on that stuff. And now people don't even know if you can believe anything. Anyway, so he says, he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. And that, that's actually, excuse me, this Greek verse contains a double negative. You should translate this, the one who overcomes, I will in no way ever, or he will in no way ever be hurt by the second death. Maybe it's clear enough without the double negative, but... The double negative, in English, a double negative makes a what? A positive. In Greek, a double negative makes the strongest negation. It's different than English. It's, it's a stronger negation. So the overcomer will in no way possible be affected by the second death. So what's your next question? What is the second death? It sounds bad, right? And somehow, if I'm an overcomer, I won't be touched by that. Well, here's the second death. The same book, same writer, John, Revelation 20, 14 and 15. The second death is a reference to the lake of fire, the destiny of all people who reject Jesus Christ as Savior, the one who died on the cross and rose on the third day. Revelation 20, 14, which verse 11 through 15, speaks of the great white throne judgment for all unbelievers. In verse 14, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. It tells you what that is. This is the second death, the lake of fire. It seems to me we're all born spiritually dead in Adam. Then we face this judgment. And if we've never believed in Christ, this is the judgment for the unbeliever, eternal lake of fire. And then he says, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, which believers are written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now read it. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. 
what will happen to the overcomer or what will never happen? He'll never go to the lake of fire. So all believers will be delivered from eternal judgment in the lake of fire as Revelation 20 verse 6 even says. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no, no power. That's another way of saying to 11, you won't be hurt by the second death. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So in my view, I think what the first resurrection represents, all believers of human history that have believed in Christ are in the first resurrection. This is not the first in order of many. The first resurrection, who was the first resurrection? Christ. Then he's the first fruits and then the church and then those who have waited for him and so forth. There's a series of resurrections. There's never been a resurrection until Christ was first raised. Then the church some argue the, 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 those that come out of the tombs in Matthew 27 uh, doesn't necessarily say they were bodily resurrected. But then there's the resurrection of the entire church, then the tribulational martyrs and the Old Testament saints, and then obviously they'll have to be one at the end of the thousand-year reign. So anyone who's believed in Christ is part of the first resurrection. And then he says, over these the second death has no power. So all men are going to die. Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment. So any person who rejects Christ as Savior will then face eternal judgment, which is the second death or the lake of fire. So i got to close, and I'm going to close with this thought. We're back to that issue of the overcomer, Right? Is it a position that all believers in union with Christ enjoy? Or is it obedient believers who receive reward for overcoming in obedience? You can go back two weeks ago and you can look at that sermon I did on trying to give a balanced approach to both of these views. So I'll say this, number one, if the overcomer refers to a child of God who actively overcomes in the spiritual life, then this is an affirmation that the obedient believer will not face eternal judgment. Fair? That's what it says if that is an active overcomer. However, the opposite must not be assumed to be true. Namely, that a disobedient child will lose his salvation and will be eternally judged. Y'all know what this possibly could be as a figure of speech? It's called litotes. Has anyone heard of that? Let me tell you what litotes is. So those who hold to the active view will have to now battle the guy that says, well, if you don't overcome, then you do go to the lake of fire. But does it say that? No, it makes an affirmation that the overcomer will not be hurt by the second death. Um, it doesn't, if it was said, however, if you don't overcome and it was an active idea, then, then you go to the lake of fire, then I'm going to change my view. I'm going to give you a story real quick, and I know I'm running late. Ravi Zacharias, who's now gone to be with the Lord, he said he was going through a very dangerous checkpoint on one of his many flights throughout the world to go give the gospel. And he said in one of these, he said it was mayhem in this place, soldiers with uh, uh, guns over their arms and all this stuff and everybody's shouting and it's just crazy and he said his little daughter he wasn't sure if he's ever going to get to his destination but his little tiny daughter walked up to one of the soldiers and said do you have any bubble gum and he said the whole room got quiet and I think it got quiet because out of the mouth of a little child in all of our crazy world look at that little child and we all know that's a little child they have no dog in this fight and look at us today we need to be more like little children in some ways, right? When we get all knowledgeable and then that's when all the hate shows up. Racism isn't inherent. Are we racist because of our color? No, it's a heart issue. And uh, did you see the, the video of the black and white kid running up to each other? They're like three and they're hugging. Because they haven't been taught this garbage. Because it's anti-Christ. God loves uh, uh, Jesus is the savior of all men. Every human life is important to him because he created it. 
and what the external epidermis looks like doesn't matter to him. Are you agreeing with me? So he died for all men equally or savable. So he, he, his little daughter walks up and says, give me any bubble gum. He said, well, the, the soldier picked her up and took her to a back room. And now he's like, oh, my God, what's going to happen now? Well, he comes back and he had given her some juice. Evidently, he didn't have bubble gum. And he took that, his whole family and got him through customs immediately. And you know what he said to his daughter? I guess later, oh, she's never getting out of this family. <laughs> Did he mean if she hadn't have done that, you're being kicked out? Lytotes. You're stating an affirmation of a way to go. The opposite isn't always true. And we know we use language like that all the time. So be careful of the person who says, because some, some believers who believe you can lose your salvation say, see, this is an active verse, and if you don't overcome, you go to hell. I, I, I don't agree, even if you hold to the active view of overcoming, that that has to be true. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones said, Lytotes is a figure of speech in which a positive statement is made by negating its opposite. Zane Hodges, in his book, The Gospel Under Siege, says Lytotes is a figure of speech in which the writer expresses an af affirmative idea through the negation of its opposite. For example, we would say, I'm not amused, meaning I'm very annoyed. I won't forget that, meaning I'll never, or excuse me, I'll return the favor. Or that test was no snap, meaning that was a tough test. So for biblical examples, you got them in Acts 12, 18, 15, 2, 17, 4, and 12, 19, 24, and 27, 20. He says the point may be that even though physical death may come, to the believer through persecution. John assures them that if they overcome, probably if they overcome and persevere to the, even to the end of their lives with faith, they are assured that the worst death, the second death in the lake of fire, will not overcome them. So being a dedicated Christian may be costly, but it will not go unrewarded. So it seems to me um, Hodges took the view it's a reward issue, an active idea, but it doesn't mean you'll lose your salvation. However, if overcomer is a positional truth and refers to what belongs to all Christians, then this is a good verse on eternal security, right? If it is positional, then he says whoever overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. If we're all overcomers, what will never happen for sure? No lake of fire for anyone. I think you can argue for both sides with no lake of fire, but the second view is, excuse me, the positional view would line up with these verses. John three sixteen through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God didn't send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So if you believe in Christ, what happens? No judgment. John 5, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment. So if you're a believer, you have life forever. You will not come under eternal judgment but you've actually passed from death into life. The unsaved man stays in death, and if he never believes, he goes to the second death, the lake of fire. And then John 10, 28, I give them eternal life. They will never perish forever, another double negative, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And then, of course, Romans 8, 1, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. I prefer the positional understanding here but either view you hold, the application is the same. In the context of being a faithful Christian to the Lord, until the point of death, the enemies of God may take your physical life, but they can do nothing about your sure eternal future with Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, oh, we thank you for the Savior. Because, Lord, if it was up to us and we had to stand before you and on our own merit based on who we are, dead in Adam, who could stand? As the scripture says, if you kept a record of, of sin, who could stand? All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. But in Christ, we stand perfect. 
We have a perfect position, and we're now in Him for all eternity. We thank You for His ultimate payment on the cross by bearing our sins and raising from the dead so that we now have eternal life. We praise You now, and we'll praise You for all eternity for this. In Jesus' precious name, amen.